Okay, so um, <clears throat> I decided that I wanted to talk about a subject I've talked about before, but I also went into a little detail in my East Asia geopolitics long, hour-long mess, but I wanted to do something a little shorter and focus on the North Korea issue because there's a lot to unpack here. Um, I want to make it clear that when I was still in college and I had participated in a Japanese speech contest that I my topic was um, the, the problems with North Korea so I, I've been kind of watching this for 20 some odd years so I think I've got a pretty good idea plus after moving to Japan I could see things a little bit closer rather than being in the United States and, and not having all the information um, and at least getting some of the information from a different source rather than the US fake news media um, so I have a quite a different perspective on all of this and then um, at the time that speech contest was in 2003 so that was still when Kim Jong-il was pres was, you know the, the, the authority authoritarian dictator of North Korea now it's his son his son's been there for over 10 years now I think pretty sure um, so I wanted to um, discuss some of the issues and I do want to talk about you know the difference between the responses of you know um, W Obama um, Trump and resident Biden or uh, resident Brandon sorry Brandon um, so um, I just want to start with the the thing that got the news going in Japan at the time was that there were quite a few Japanese who had been kidnapped by North Korea and taken to North Korea and you know um, uh, they were they they found out that these people had been kidnapped they thought that like the parents of these people who had been kidnapped thought they were dead turned out that North Korea had kidnapped them <clears throat> now the main issue was was that Japan because you know they have to you know hide behind the United States because the United States is the real owner of this country um, <clears throat> they um, the families one of the families went to visit Bush in 2005 I want to say it was somewhere around there it was it was I think during Bush's second term that they went over to the United States asking the US to help put pressure on North Korea to give back their relatives or at least give back their you know the remains of the people who if these kidnapped people had died to give back their remains well Kim Jong-il was completely you know um, he seemed to want to do something but he kind of like dragged his feet and of course Bush because of the whole you know Iraq war thing talking about Iran North Korea and um, uh, what is it uh, Iraq being is it Iran Iraq and North Korea being an axis of evil or some stupid thing it created more problems for this region and Kim Jong-il got kind of pissed off about that so that increased the number of missiles that's when until that point North Korea hadn't done any nuclear missile tests so um, uh, <clears throat> the um, uh, that basically pushed Kim Jong Il to want to get a nuclear deterrent because they were um, uh, what is it um, uh, the the they were worried that because the way Bush was warmongering that they would have to defend themselves now was it in violation of international law and and the rules set out with you know the IAEA and all that stuff sure but you know when a cat's in a corner it's gonna get ready to attack right so it increased the number of missiles it started shooting into the Sea of Japan it started you know um, testing nuclear weapons all this fun stuff well then we get you know Barry into office 
And he basically continued on the same path as W did with having a very um, adversarial relationship with North Korea. And there was no, like, um, even when Barry came to Japan and he went to the city of Obama, because there's a city in, I think it was Fukui, it's called Obama. Um, it's a tiny little place, but oh, oh my God, it's Obama, it's Obama, it's Barry, it's Barry, ah. Uh. And so that was a big thing that happened over here. I was here at the time when that happened, so I, I remember that happening. But the thing was that the, the, under Barry's administration, there was no... Um, the, the, the relationship between North Korea and the United States didn't change. And the entire time, of course, Japan had been, you know, um, like, because Koizumi was a more warmongerish prime minister, he was the first prime minister to send self-defense force troops overseas to help W play with his toys in the sand. Um, and, uh, Obama, uh, Barry was um, uh, basically on the same line. He didn't do anything about that because he would rather play with his toys in the sand in Libya and Syria. <clears throat> and there was still, you know, with the political atmosphere here, after Koizumi stepped down as prime minister, it was Abe that came up. And then he quit because, oh, my stomach hurts. I'm so stressed out. <laughs> Crying like a little baby. Um, and then that brought in the DPJ is the first time ever having control in the Japanese of the Japanese government. The first time they could ever have a prime minister that was not of the LDP. And, you know, they, of course, the, the DPJ does, as the name Democratic Party of Japan doesn't exist anywhere. It means still doesn't exist. It's under like a couple different names. They've splintered off into a couple different factions. Um... So they have a couple different names, but um, the <clears throat> what was it? The um, during that time they were they had their hands full because you know the all of the the well what you call the Japanese oligarchs, you know the 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 what are the Zaibots like Mitsubishi and those groups, um, they were very closely allied with the LDP. So they were, you know, fighting. They, they weren't being forthright with the DPJ. And then um, when the earthquake happened in 2011, the DPJ was at a complete loss of how to handle the situation. I mean, of course, the, the LDP wouldn't have done any better. But the thing was is that um, TEPCO actually withheld information from the DPJ so to make them look bad so they could put the LDP back into power and this was you know every time the DPJ and the Prime Minister at the time Khan he would try to get information about you know Fukushima and, and the nuclear like the, the waste leaks and stuff like that they would delay and delay and delay and they wouldn't um they would always do their own press conferences. They would never do anything with the government at all. Whereas they will do things with the government, you know, if it was the LDP, they'd be perfectly fine doing it. But they don't, they didn't do that with the DPJ. Now, at the time, actually, what was really interesting was North Korea saw what had happened with the earthquake. And actually, North Korea was kind of, you know, they weren't as adversarial with Japan as people might think during that time because everybody was sad about what happened and how big the tidal wave was and all that other stuff. <clears throat> um, and how big the earthquake was and all that other stuff. But um, they, um, it wasn't as adversarial. Um, it was more adversarial with the United States. And because the United States has other bases over here, they were trying to antagonize the United States. If they pissed off the Japanese, the Japanese would tell the U.S., hey, go get them. And, you know, they were hoping that they would do that. And there was a time, I believe, during Barry's second term where they weren't doing their, um, their war exercises with South Korea. And that kind of, for, for all of Barry's faults, um, the times where they didn't do the... Uh, war games exercises with South Korea, it kind of 
brought a, a, a an uneasy quietness to the region, right? So between like South Korea, North Korea, and Japan, we won't even deal with China in this. We're just gonna stick with with the three main players in this. Well, the four main players, um, but not China. <clears throat> then um, the thing that made me the happiest. So I was supporting Orange Man before. I don't anymore. Um, if I say why I don't, then YouTube will probably, you know, get pissy with my video. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. There, I have my reasons. Um, but the thing that I was really happy with that he did was he tried to normalize relations with North Korea. And he tried to, you know, somebody had to step up because North Korea, because they're basically a puppet state for, you know, um, the CCP to, to have a buffer state between South Korea and them and South Korea being a metaphor for the United States. Um, the, the fact that Orange Man went over to North Korea and actually crossed the DMZ into North Korean territory. This was an amazing event in the world of geopolitics. People don't seem to realize this, um, how important this event was. No president had ever done it. Could Trump have done it because he wanted to, um, just cause so he could brag about it? Sure, he could have, but just the fact of him doing it and actually, you know, trying to have direct communication with North Korea, which is something the U.S. hadn't had since W. There was no direct communication between North Korea and Barry's administration. It was always through intermediaries, through South Korea or through Japan. It was never a direct line. W sent, um, well, of course, uh, Slick Willie also, you know, he didn't person I think Sleek Willie did go to or did meet with Kim Jong Il before. But like not in North Korea if I recall correctly. Where um Trump went to Vietnam, met with Kim Jong un, had a nice conversation with him, and then they decided, okay, how about I invite you to the DMZ? We can have some talks there you have your photo op because crossing over the dmz into north korean territory the first president ever to do that i'm sure he'd brag about it but he doesn't he brags about other things that are completely useless but um but this was i, I can't stress i'm gonna repeat myself how important and how amazing those actions by Trump were to actually cross into the DMZ. Everybody who was like anti-Trump was um, basically saying, you know, oh, he's just going to get himself killed. They're not going to do anything, blah, 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 blah. They're not being, North Korea is not being up front. They're not being honest in their negotiations, blah, blah, blah. They're finding every way to make this look bad. And... Um, from my perspective at the time, I had been looking into, you know, this, you know, North Korea stuff at the time, it was about 14 or 15 years. Now it's up to 20, but, um, I'd been looking at this for some time and the fact that, you know, there was direct communication between the United States and North Korea, North Korea stopped firing their missiles into the Sea of Japan. There was a sense that maybe things would calm down a little bit in this region. And then we get Brandon. And Brandon has done his completely ignored Asia. Completely. There's nothing he's like he snubbed Japan on a trip when he was coming over here uh, a few weeks ago. I think he went to China or South Korea, but he skipped Japan. And this is very, very relevant because um, when a United States president has 
come to Asia, they've always stopped in Japan. It is, they, they would either go to South Korea, then come to Japan on their way back, or they'd stop in Japan and then go to South Korea and then go back to the United States, or maybe go to China or some other uh, country, and then they would go back to the United States. Brandon completely ignored Japan. And even in the fake news over here, they were like, well, why is Brandon ignoring us? And even the Japanese government was concerned about why is Brandon ignoring us? Why is he doing, why is he going, I think it was to South Korea, I don't remember exactly. Um, why is he going there but not coming here? So you can tell there's been a massive shift in the, the way the United States is responding to someone who's supposedly their ally. I'm concerned that the way the government is working, well, the U.S. government is working for, <clears throat> um, uh, for, um, you know, in every situation here, um, <clears throat> that, um, sorry, that was my alarm. I should have turned it off beforehand, but oh well. Um, the fact, just the simple fact that he ignored Japan on his trip to Asia is a very massive slap to the face of the Japanese people. And I think that might be part of why there's a bigger push to amend Article 9 of the Constitution over here. Um, because Japan is starting to see, well, maybe the U.S. is not going to actually protect us when the time comes, which they were never going to, but we'll, we'll leave that for another day. Um, but I'm honestly concerned that Brandon ignoring Japan is going to ignite something over here that could be on the level of something what's going on in Ukraine and Russia. I think it could. I mean, of course, you know, it won't be as, you know, like involved as, you know, Russia and Ukraine are, but I think that it could create another rift in this part of Asia that could uh, like roll out of control. So, um, anyway, that's all for this video, you know, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Um, I back up all my videos on other sites. I want you to take a look at those links because that's where I post most of my, um, most of my articles that I read and translate so people can see what the fake news is saying over here. Um, I, you know, because I don't like to censor myself, so, and by doing that, you know, YouTube will, um, uh, easily destroy my account, so, um, I just want to make that clear that most of my uploads are on those other sites, so, um, I just want to do a little talk about North Korea and, and the situation over the past four presidencies and that kind of thing, so, uh, see you next time.